Well, thank you for the chance to introduce this uh, great and funny, I think, movie based on a greater and a funnier novel. <laughs> and, uh, how many of you here had a chance to maybe read the novel? Well, this is, if you're looking for some fun and somewhat historically challenging reading, that would be something to attack because in fact, our mutual friend, uh, a, great, a fantastic writer and translator, Anne Fisher, translated uh, Ilf and Petrov's novel, or a comedy, last year. And uh, it's available on Amazon. You can read the 12 chairs and decide for yourself what do you think of this interpretation, because a lot of things are different. They are not different in the movie from the novel, as I read it as a child, as I remember it and I reread it as an adult, it's also different from other interpretations because there were a lot of movies based on this novel. And uh, I, of course, am familiar with two, I believe, Russian versions. One of them was the TV series which was so good and so popular uh, that my parents, who usually did not allow me to watch any television shows, allowed me to watch that. Uh, but it is, uh, there's always been uh, about 20 versions or 18 um, of movies based on this novel and I was surprised to find out that there was one supposedly in Nazi Germany made in the 30s although uh, the authors were not properly acknowledged because there's two authors, Ilf and Petrov, and Ilf was Jewish, so for obvious reasons. Um, however, when I thought about it, um, I think that the authors hit on some archetype there, or something that speaks not just to Russians, but to pretty much any nationality, because the movies were made throughout the globe, at least in Europe and America. Uh, and I will come back to it, because there's some certain symbolism of chairs, and even the number 12. Um, so the movie that you will be watching is a light, uh, fun uh, version with Charlie Chaplin-esque feel to it. I think you'll see people fall, and my son, who is 12, enjoyed it greatly. Um, which is always a compliment to the movie. However, the novel itself has a lot more sophistication to it and has many layers of meaning and just like pretty much anything in Russian literature in general and especially in literature written after 1917 after Bolsheviks came to power has a lot of hidden layers in it because certain things had to be hidden. Uh, so I decided to introduce, to make a short introduction of the movie by maybe touching on the hidden levels rather than on what you can see. And um, the, the authors are from Odessa. That's one last thing before the symbolism, which tends to be a little more, um, if not sophisticated, but serious. But the language in Odessa is something to be uh, highlighted. Uh, Odessans are famous for speaking like stand-up comedians. Like, in fact, I spent every summer of my childhood there and everybody speaks like Woody Allen there. It's just, it's hilarious. It has this, uh, there were a lot of Jews there, so it has like a little Yiddish touch to it, and just a mix of Ukrainians and Moldovanians about everything, and the street humor. And Astad Bender, one of the protagonists in the movie and in the novel, uh, is the representation of this work and humor. Everything he says is hilarious in the book. And in fact, a lot of phrases became incorporated into the Russian language these days. People would repeat phrases from this novel and would immediately respond, and sometimes even without the knowledge that they are from the novel. Mm. Now, coming to the more serious part of the novel, uh, the chair itself has a lot of hidden meaning in it. Uh, and if you think about it, it could represent the authority, the domination, the power. In fact, if you were here for the Russian Ark, you had a chance to see the Winter Palace with all the thrones and multiple luxurious chairs and French furniture. And that was a symbol of a power. So when uh, our heroes are going, cutting open with knives and their hands and almost teeth through the chairs looking for the hidden values, 
or jewels, it has a symbolical meaning because in 1917, uh, the people of, of Russia, uh, the peasants and the workers, came and at attacked the Russian Ark with the Winter Palace. In the opening scene of the movies, uh, of the movie that you will see, uh, Osta Bender stands with a sign saying, I lost one eye and one leg in Winter Palace meaning in 1917, which of course is a total lie because it was the most bloodless revolution ever. I think there were probably six victims of it and they slipped on ice or something like this. There were a lot more victims after that, but not during the storm of the Winter Palace. So uh, the chairs therefore represent the power that is now being overthrown, the jewels hidden in the seat that is also taken, the seat of the world, uh, are the values. So one of the heroes, Varabyaninov, is a member of the Russian nobility. He is looking for the values lost, for his family riches, uh, for, for everything that was expropriated from him, and historically something that is long gone, the, the bourgeois well-being of Russia. Uh, Osta Bendo, on the other hand, who is a very charismatic, brilliant, charming conman and a thief, is looking for his happiness for something he never had. Uh, and they both don't find it, or they will. We'll find out at the end of the movie. So their search for the value is also symbolic. Uh, even the number 12, there is no, not 13, not 7, there is 12. Of course, the immediate association is the apostles. And as you might know, in the Soviet Union, the religion was no more. And then you will see there's a, another link there, because one of their rivals is a priest. So you make your own connection there. Um, and if you want to experiment a little bit with the thought, chairs have a lot more meanings. Um, let's say, of course, it came much later, but if you think of Ionesca chairs, you know, it leaves you with the thought, what chair are you sitting in? You know, at the end of the day when empty chairs or chairs are ripped and no more chairs left, it leaves you with the thought, what are you looking for? I don't think Mel Brooks necessarily went for it, but I think in the novel all these layers are to be found. At least that's how I see it and that's how I interpret it. Um, and uh, there were a couple of other things. We were visiting our Hearst ca castle the other day uh, with the family for the vacation and I couldn't help but thinking how here everything stayed preserved and nobody came reopening the seats of the, of the riches. Everything is still there and that, that, that other world went through this turmoil. So there's something for you to think <laughs> as well. Um, so. Um, yeah, there's one more, the last episode I wanted to comment on, which is, I think, very important and is also important for me personally. At some point, uh, Osta Bender, who is a conman and a thief, uh, is asking the former member of nobility to beg and basically humiliate himself because they need money. And he, the member of nobility, th that is, uh, answers, he's enraged. He says, uh, we never beg. We, we are proud, we, we don't do that. And for the first and only time throughout the movie, um, Oster Bender becomes, becomes very angry and he says, I have no place for pride in my life. All my life I had to survive and make my way through it. And so now you're going to do it or else you know, you're out and you're dead. And I will not disclose you the ending of the movie, but the ending is quite sad that way because, in fact, there is no pride and there is no place for human dignity in the society that the Bolsheviks built in my country. And that is, I think, is the saddest part about the novel, perhaps in the movie, because you might see this little sadness in the end. And I think it's the best expressed by Gogol, another Russian writer, who said there is the uh, invisible laughter through the visible to the world. T uh, there is the other way around. There is the I'm translating from that. So there is a, uh, the invisible tears through the visible laughter. So when you laugh, 
with Wilfred Petrov also know that they were crying while writing this. Mm -hmm. 